Good afternoon, everybody. Happy World Environment Day. Yay! <laughs> so I'm Shannon Bennett. I'm Chief of Science at the California Academy of Sciences, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome some expert panelists, the audience, the virtual audience, to celebrate together World Environment Day with our deep, deep, friends and partners, the San Francisco Department of the Environment, uh, the city and county of San Francisco, of course, San Francisco Rec and Parks, and then we have some experts that really represent a lot of different uh, voices in our San Francisco community where we all have deep uh, shared goals around protecting the environment, celebrating the biodiversity that we care so much about. And here at the Academy, we've invested about 163 years in uh, investigating and in following and tracking the dynamics of uh, our Bay Area biodiversity here and beyond, which are so important to a healthy environment. So today, I think we're going to hear a lot more about that. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Debbie Raphael, the uh, director of San Francisco Department of the Environment. Thanks, Shannon. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for hosting us. I just want to say, as director of Department of Environment, uh, it's kind of a special place to be right now in San Francisco, in the Bay Area. There's a lot of craziness happening all around the country right now. And it's nice to be the bubble inside the bubble and be in a place where all of us share our commitment to preserving this planet. And there's no better place to do that than at Cal Academy here, uh, where it's whether it's the green roof or the planetarium, so from the stars to the soil, we are appreciating Mother Nature. And it's a very big day for Cal Academy of Sciences because they are now officially a green business. So I want to congratulate <laughs> Cal Academy on that. There's a huge long checklist that they had to do and can be painful at times that some people in the audience know. But they persevered, and it's quite, it's quite an accomplishment. I also want to give a big shout out to those of you watching from our live streaming service. I want to thank SFGovTV for helping us with that technology, because this is an event that is not a San Francisco event. This is World Environment Day, and it is sponsored by the United Nations. And this year, the United Nations selected as their theme, Connecting Cities to Nature. When we heard the theme, immediately we thought, wow, we need to be a part of that. We are a city who treasures our nature, our natural ecosystems, whether they be on a hillside, in our backyards, or on a roof. And so I'm very excited to co-sponsor this event with Phil Ginsburg and the Rec and Park Department for the city and county of San Francisco, because truly there is no bigger champion of all that biodiversity than my colleague, Phil. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. So I want to echo Debbie's uh, thanks to the Academy for hosting us. Uh, uh, the Academy is a model uh, for a greener, healthier planet. Um, and I also want to thank Debbie and the Department of the Environment for including us and in being such strong leaders on environmental issues. Um, it is nice to be in the bubble, in the bubble. Um, we are very blessed in San Francisco. About 20% of our land is open space. And about a third of that, about a third of that supports biodiversity. Um, and why does biodiversity matter? In Golden Gate Park, where we are today, the rest of the park was built around our coastal oak woodlands. The rest of it is fake. It's ocean. It was beach. It's sand, right? And the stuff that was here before Golden Gate Park was built almost 150 years ago uh, promotes and supports our biodiversity. Um, so it's very appropriate that we're here in Golden Gate Park. And I want to make one more plug. When I heard cities connecting, uh, 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 connecting cities to nature, um, there's another C that the Rec and Park Department is involved in, and that's um, cities connecting children to nature. Yes. And as the urban form in this city continues to get harder and harder, and as we grow and grow and become more dense, the fact that we can go to Glen Canyon, where I was this morning, or go out to the Oak Woodlands and still have pure, unadulterated nature, and we can still bring kids that uh, may never get to Yosemite or may never get to Glacier uh, just a you know, few short blocks away and have them you know, connect with with, with flora and fauna and biodiversity is pretty amazing. So we should all be very proud of that. Thank you. And Phil and I are honored to be joined by an illustrious panel. 
And because of our short amount of time, the panel has a big challenge because this is something they live and breathe every day. And their challenge is to be succinct and brief and to the point. So we will all judge their success at that. And I challenge them on that. So their first, so what we're going to do as a way, way of introductions is I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves quickly to you, who they are, who they represent professionally. And then I've asked them to give us their elevator pitch. Why is biodiversity important? Why should we care? So we'll start with Luke. Thank you. Appreciate you guys having us all today. This is a great conversation to be a part of. My name is Lou Stringer. I am an ecologist with the Presidio Trust, a financially independent uh, federal national park. Um, it's about 1,400 acres in San Francisco that we manage as a national park. And I have been working for the past 20 years to restore the wildlands of, of the Presidio and bring back much of the biodiversity that was either leaving the Presidio in San Francisco or has already gone. So we're bringing actively restoring creeks, uh, sand dunes, oak woodlands, and actively bringing back species that are either lost or were on the, on the way out. So for me, it's a very personal question. It's been my whole career has been asking this this important question, why is biodiversity important? And we, we hear a lot about biodiversity. Why is it important that we have pollination, we have clean water, we have all of these things that support humans, ultimately? But I would, I would say that there's an important question that we often don't talk about, which is, is ultimately a spiritual question and a moral question about humans and, and, the, and nature. And I, I sometimes lead with that because it is often overlooked in the conversations about what is important about the mechanistic world of one species making it possible for another species to survive. So I, I think since we're also talking about cities, it makes so much sense to me in the context of today in San Francisco in general, where we see so much change going on. We see so many people this great diversity of people having to leave San Francisco. And we all know individuals that are having to, to go away because the cost of living is too high here. Blue the same the elevator is already at the <laughs> 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 Okay. I'm over here, okay. All I would say is that <laughs> feeling that you know as San Franciscans and people in other parts of the world of people having to move away and the loss that that feels, that I feel every day when we think about the biodiversity that is leaving the city. So I will, I'll leave it at that. Beautiful. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle G. I'm the Chief of Interpretation and Education for Golden Gate National Recreation Area with the National Park Service. Um, GGNRA uh, is an 82,000 acre park which spans three counties, San Mateo, San Francisco, and Marin County. And Many people have probably heard of sites such as um, Your Woods, uh, Presidio, Land's End, um, Stinson Beach, lots of places, Alcatraz. Um, but to succinctly answer your question, <laughs> um, why is biodiversity important? I would say, why is it not? <laughs> it's really, a, that's a really hard uh, question bravo. because it's, it's everything. And um, it's the way that we as a planet are strong and resilient and beautiful. And there's such an intrinsic value. There's a scientific value. There's a beauty, there's everything about it. So it's really hard to say why it is because why is it not? It's everything. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Johnson, and I co-run our citizen science program here at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, through that program, we, we work, my colleague Allison Young and I work to connect people to nature wherever they are. If it's walking through Golden Gate Park, if it's in a special local San Francisco park, or if it's in a special place further afield, we work to um, gather people in places that they care about um, to make and share observations of biodiversity of the natural world. And then our job is to mobilize that information for science and conservation. Um, so why is biodiversity important? And Michelle, actually, and Lou, I just want to echo what they said. Biodiversity is everything. And for me, to put a little story on it, is that to me, biodiversity and plants and animals and nature is how we all understand the natural world. 
we go out and we see an insect or a flower or a piece of grass, anything, that is our connection to how the planet works. It's the first place that we start to ask questions like, why is this butterfly here now? Why is this plant flowering now? It's a connection to science and nature and how things work, and it's our gateway to understanding the world. I'm Gretchen Laboon. I'm a professor at San Francisco State University. I also run a large citizen science project called the Great Sunflower Project, which focuses on pollinators and plants. And as a biologist, biodiversity to me um, has some specific meanings. It, it speaks to the um, variation in everything from genes that confer things like disease resistance to the ecosystems from the Arctic to the deserts of California. Um, and when I think about the, the value in particular to humans, I really think about the resilience that that diversity gives us from actually being able to protect us from disease to um, places to move to as the habitats change. So I think that the, the plants and animals that exist provide lots of services to humans, but the, the broad scale of biodiversity is really about resilience mm -hmm. and, um, and also wonder. Um, I'm Tom Radulovich, Executive Director of Livable City. We're a nonprofit organization here in the city. We run a, a very popular program called Sunday Streets, where we uh, turn the 25% of San Francisco's land area that is in the public right of way um, over to the citizens and let them use it as a re place to recreate, place to, uh, to connect with their neighbors uh, and just have a great time. We also do policy and advocacy. Um, for us, livability comes when you've got sustainability, when you've got equity, uh, and when you've got health and happiness um, all kind of uh, uh, working together. Uh, and uh, we promote policies that promote all of those things, bring together here in the city. And, uh, you know, I... Biodiversity is important to me just personally because I, I think it's, it's beautiful and amazing. It's one of the most uh, incredible things about the Bay Area. One is that nature is never very far. Second, that nature is so diverse, that we've got redwood forests, that we've got oak woodlands, that we've got grasslands, that we've got shrublands, that um, we've got all of these, you know, thousands of plants and animals living in this region uh, in all these different combinations, depending on weather and soil and all of that. It's, it's really an extraordinary thing, it's internationally recognized as such. Uh, and so that's part of it is just the, the beauty of it. And uh, certainly it's also that resiliency, just that uh, if you've got this incredible diversity of plants and animals, that system can take knocks and we are knocking at it heavily. So the, the way, you know, it's the way that life sustains life is through biodiversity. And, and I think that's uh, why we need to protect it. One, we've got an obligation to do that. It's just the right thing to do. You don't come in and destroy um, you know, billions of years of uh, evolutionary genius. Um, <laughs> that's just crass um, and not something anyone should do. But uh, on a purely self-interested level, we should do it because uh, we're dependent on all of that biodiversity to keep this place livable for us. Wow. So there's a, there's a fundamental spiritual element here, a moral element, as well as a scientific element that's come across. Thank you. All right, well, let's start asking some questions. So, um, Rebecca, I'm going to start with you. Right. Um, we currently, a lot of news uh, about energy and climate change. So those are terms which the public hears a lot about. The term biodiversity may be a little bit less. It's a complicated term. What does it mean? We just talked about why it's important. Where does biodiversity fit in in the, in the great debate that's happening uh, around us today? Well, that's a big question. So <clears throat> I think that one of the ways that biodiversity fits together with the climate change conversation that we hear a lot about is that one of the, and we see this with our volunteers that we take out in the field, that changes in biodiversity and changes in what people see is a way to really connect people to the real changes that are happening, the bigger changes to our cl climate. So for example, we um, work in the tide pools locally and we see lots of animals that are moving north, that their ranges are changing because of warmer waters and other changing climatic conditions. So this is a way for people to really see what climate change looks like. So instead of just hearing that like, oh, climate change is happening, it's warmer, and like trying to parse out weather and climate change and global systems, understanding biodiversity and how it's changing is something that is really real for right. people. And they can witness it, and they can share what they're seeing to help us understand and make a difference. So that's one way, but also 
I don't want to talk too much because of our panel, but they're, they're completely linked. So changes in biodiversity, especially things like deforestation and changes in grasslands and carbon sequestration, lead to climate change as much as climate change leads to changes in biodiversity. So to summarize, mm -hmm. biodiversity actually is a little bit of an antidote to climate change. Yes. Would that be fair to say? Sure. <laughs> great. That's great. So Tom, how does, as we all heard, uh, our president withdrew us from the Paris Climate Agreement a few days ago. How does that withdrawal affect your work uh, and, your, and all of our collective work on behalf of biodiversity? Yeah, well, I, well I, hopefully it won't actually work. I mean, he announced that he was going to do it, but uh, as with a lot of things, it takes quite a while to, get, to extricate yourself. So um, hopefully it won't actually happen. I, I think it's uh, just really given a sense of urgency to our work. Um, one is, you know, we, we want this city to be uh, more sustainable and we want it to be greener. We want it to be more livable and more healthy because that's the right thing to do for the folks who live here uh, and to pre protect local nature. I think it's more important also than ever that San Francisco be a model, that, uh, that we create exportable models, that people can look to this city and when they're trying to figure out, well, what ought we try and do uh, to have a city like San Francisco um, doing things that work uh, is, is, is that much more important. Um, lastly, I'd say that, that uh, a lot of the decisions, though, uh, the, a lot of the things that we do that most affect the climate, that most affect biodiversity, are local decisions. You know, we, you know the, the, the president has enormous importance. Uh, symbolically, there's a lot the federal government can do. But if you think about it, the ways that we get around transportation uh, is a huge impact on the environment, huge uh, amount of carbon emissions. The way we build buildings uh, is another huge set of impacts. Uh, Things like local food systems, where do you grow your food, how far away is it coming from, those are hugely affecting in terms of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and all of those other ways that we affect biodiversity. Those are local decisions. Those are decisions that are made in this community yeah. uh, or in this region. And the, the feds don't make those decisions. They might fund good projects if we come up with good ones. Uh, they might fund bad projects if we come up with bad ones. But uh, those are local decisions. And I think uh, there's a huge amount of leverage we have as citizens of the Bay Area, San Francisco, this region, uh, to make the right decisions in those areas. And, and they're, they're going to have an enormous impact uh, in a region of, what, is it 7 million people these yep. days? Yeah. It matters what we do. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else want to jump in on that decision? Does it any, given anybody heartburn or thought about their work? I feel like I've had more conversations about climate change in the past month than in the mm -hmm. whole, the previous three years. Yeah. And if nothing else, I think it's really made people nice. think about mm -hmm. what we're giving up by not engaging on climate. Yep. And I'm, I'm delighted to hear how many citizens and corporations are really saying it doesn't, this decision doesn't affect what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. right. And I feel inspired by that. Silver lining, absolutely. So think globally, act locally. Yes, yes. or globally. <laughs> um, you know, my, you know, my, my, uh, my thought about that is, is that it's been such an effort over the last decade or two to get the world at large to understand why this topic is important. And, it, and what is most frustrating to me about uh, our... Uh, this national decision by our president, is that we were all finally there. I mean, there are a few things right. in the world that we actually all kind of agree on, and we kind of had to screw that up. Um, but anyway, um, I'm going to turn over to Lou now. Uh, so you do a lot of restoration work in the Presidio. So, so explain the significance of uh, ecological restoration in, in, a, in a big city, in an urban setting. Why does it, why does it matter? So it, it matters because of what I was talking about earlier. There's this connection that people have to nature. And by engaging in the act of restoring a landscape, it gives people, children, adults, all of this way to connect and learn about their natural world. And, and so that the practice of it is incredibly restorative to people, I think, I'd say. The, the, the concept of agriculture, the culture part of that is really... Re vital to what we and the community of people that are actually doing the work. But why is it important for, for other things? Well, when you take a creek that was put in a pipe uh, 50, 100 years ago and take it out and spread it across the landscape, there is this opportunity to bring back 
a lot of life that was currently taken away. And why do we get rid of those in the first place? Because they were inconvenient or they were engineered in ways that we didn't necessarily need them. And so as we've eliminated those things, we've recognized there's been an incredible loss and that we all feel that loss. And so when we don't when we live in a city, we want to be connected to nature, but it's not necessarily close by. So bringing back nature has incredible benefits that we've also felt, but we also recognize uh, that are economic. So we have all sorts of problems in the city of San Francisco dealing with our stormwater runoff. One of the ways you can do that is to bring that water back in the landscape and slow it down and put it back in the ground. So Ecological restoration has engineering elements of it that have great economic benefits as well. So I'd say there are so many aspects to the reasons why we want to do those things. But there's also the beauty of it. When you act, actually get to see nesting hummingbirds in a, in a willow stand that was formerly an asphalt uh, pavement, that, that's a, a spiritual dimension that is really important to us. Well, this question is for our two citizen science experts, Rebecca and Gretchen. How do we, so we know that doing restoration in an urban setting is critical. We've talked about the why and what it might look like. How do we know if we're doing a good job? How do we measure success? Can we measure success? Are there metrics? So metrics for biodiversity in particular. Um, so I think citizen science is a, a great way to connect people in biodiversity. And um, I can speak for a moment just about my project because I know it best. Um, I have a project where people go out in their backyard and they measure how many um, pollinators visit a plant. Mm. And then they can go in online and do a checklist and see you know, how well their garden's doing according to our checklist for pollinators. And then and they get a score. But the next year when they've made some modifications, they can go out and they can see whether their pollinator service went up. And they can make some more checks. And so, you know, there are lots of ways that we can have people engage with the, the, um, their backyards or their parks or their wild areas and, and have metrics that could give feedback as to biodiversity, ecosystem services, so the, the things that nature provides us. I, I think it's a, it's a way for people to own the data and to own the nice. place and to contribute. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would just add that um, for people to get out to a place that's been restored and see something new, like Lou described, where there used to be asphalt and now there's something different, that is really, really powerful for people to witness a change that they maybe helped um, happen. Um, to really, and to gather those data, like Gretchen was saying, those data could be collected by professionals and could be collected by um, amateurs and they need to be collected by both, right? And so it's really, really important that citizen science is a really key way to connect people to nature and to collect um, some kinds of data, but there is a place to really evaluate if a restoration has been successful that is best done by the professional ecologist or professional ecologist training students or training people like them right next to each other doing this work. I think for us, speaking for the work that we do, when we take people out into nature, and if we can't tell if an area has been restored or not, if you see the same pollinators, you know, in the oak woodland here as somewhere else that someone planted oaks and has really tended to that understory and done really great work, if you can't tell if the area has been restored or not, that's a kind of low-hanging um, way of measuring success. And that happens all the time because on iNaturalist, the platform we use for our work, we try to have people mark if plants are cultivated and sometimes people are like, I'm not sure, is this, this native plant that someone planted, is it cultivated or not? And so that's a really interesting question mm -hmm. that gets people thinking about nature and what nature means. And is nature just restored nature or is nature nature that was there before? It's a very interesting and nice conversation that we start having. Thank you, Rudy. Um, Michelle, your turn. So <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about access to nature and, and, and the notion of equity. And, what do you think the, the, role of na the role that nature plays in a city with respect to these, the idea of environmental justice? Well, I definitely think that, um, you know, nature in the city is fundamental. Um, 
1972, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area was actually um, established as a part of a movement to bring um, nature and national parks closer to those urban residents um, so that you didn't have to get in an airplane or um, in their car and drive across country to see the Yosemites, the Grand Canyons, the glaciers, um, but you could actually get to a park that was um, a bus ride away. Um, and there's so much value um, in these places um, that we've seen, the health value. Um, they've done lots of studies around the value of nature, um, reducing stress levels, um, diabetes, um, uh, more focus. Um, you see that a lot with children who maybe don't do well in a classroom environment, but do amazing out in nature. Um, and so the value of um, having wild spaces, but also having parks, um, local pocket parks, um, it, it makes it a livable city. It makes some place that you really want to be at. And the question of equity, I would say, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of um, talk about um, the visitation to national parks and other places and how it's not diverse and it's not reflective of America. And you look at the environmental movement, um, and it's also not reflective of the diversity of America um, and I hear a preservation model talked about a lot, like if we don't get those folks engaged, then we will cease to exist, we'll cease to survive because people will vote parks out. But it's not really a preservation model, it's an equity model. Um, the, the idea that everybody deserves the access and the benefits to these Bases, um, it's, it's what it's really about, and there's been a lot of you know historical records that reveal not everyone was always welcome in these spaces. You just look at Sutro Baths right around the corner, um, and that was a segregated place. Um, and it was California was the um, the Dibble Act was one of the first or was the first in the nation to um, say that segregation of public spaces was not okay way before its time in 1897, um, and um, John Harris sued Sutro and won. Um, yet he kept segregating the baths for another 40 years. Um, and so you see this history of people not being welcome in public spaces. Um, and so to turn that around is definitely about justice and equity um, and making sure everybody gets access to these amazing spaces. Besides the history, which is very real, and you know, battling that back, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers um, to getting people in underserved neighborhoods or creating more equity in terms of access to nature in our city? Uh, well, there's real physical barriers. You know, there's there's the competition for time um, and money and where you're going to spend it and how to get to a place that you're not familiar with. And then there's a lot of perception that I'm not going to be welcome there. I'm not going to be safe there. Um, it's not something that my family has traditionally done. Um, and so, you know, trying to change and break down those barriers, I've seen some amazing programs. This year we're partnering with the San Francisco Public Library um, and actually doing free shuttles um, at different um, library sites to come to our national parks. And the one from your woods I already hear is a 200 person wait list and it was only been advertised for a week. Um, but, you know, getting out the word and, and using multiple languages um, at our parks, having interpreters that speak Spanish and Chinese and all languages, you know, so that people feel welcome when they do come out. One quick plug for San Francisco, which is, for, I don't know if everybody is aware of this, but we are the first major city in the United States where 100% of our residents live within a 10-minute walk of a park. We are the first city to achieve that, that standard, which is, huge, pretty, huge. which is pretty cool. So, Michelle, thank you for that answer and Phil for that fact, because that leads beautifully into the question for Tom. I mean, the name of your organization is Livable City. Mm -hmm. So when you think about a livable city, how does this discussion of nature fit in and how are, how, what kind of barriers do you see that are so important for us to address? Sure, well, I, a, a lot of it is, you know, goes directly to the health and happiness. And, and a, a, a livable city is a walkable city. So, so what Phil talked about was very, very important. You know, if you look at, you know, what makes your neighborhood livable, it's that you can walk to things. And it might be walking to transit, it should be walking to stores and services, but it should also be walking to green open space. So um, that's terrifically important. Um, and I think, as was said earlier, they, that, uh, you know, cities can be incredibly stressful places to live, and they're probably getting more so. Um, you know, a lot of our transportation decisions, you know, a, a transportation system dependent on private automobiles just creates a really polluted environment, a really noisy environment, and so on. And uh, there's a lot of studies. Somerville, Massachusetts is one where they looked at, you know, sort of health data across the city and happiness data across the city, correlated that with where they lived. They, they were able to map it, and they found 
things like street trees huh. um, were the equivalent of a $10,000 raise in terms of happiness, <laughs> um, or um, being several years younger. So uh, having street trees on your street <laughs> is the usual. same as being uh, four to seven years younger. That's extraordinary that there's you know, these very, very small differences in our immediate physical environment have huge effects on our happiness and on our health. So uh, I think uh, nature in the city begins there, things like street trees, reclaiming some of the space on our streets for, uh, for greenery and making sure that that is done equitably because there's some inequity around that too. If you look at a lot of low-income neighborhoods, they're um, uh, sometimes the least green. And then also the other green that we can introduce into neighborhoods, whether those are public parks, whether those are rear yards, or those are roof decks, kind of the required open space uh, that we have and in, in these multi-unit buildings. So um, as we get denser, making sure that we keep and make room for nature um, so, and it's, it's a difficult thing, right? We want to add a lot more housing to this city because a lot of more people want to live here and city living is greener than suburban living. So, you know, if we let people live in the city better for the environment, better for their health because they're walking places, they're not in their car all the time. Uh, but as we do that, you know, just that very thoughtful attention to, you know, making sure that those environments are quality environments, everything they see. Can you look out your window and see green? That's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's those studies of hospitals. The people who had the view out the, of the tree, you know, were out of the, checked out of the hospital several days earlier than the people who were looking at the cement wall. So, um, so what do you see when you look out your window? What, uh, you know, when you walk out your front door, is it green? Uh, those are things we can do, and, and I think that's the 21st century challenge is creating these, you know, dense, livable, vital cities that are very, very full of nature mm. uh, and where, you know, biodiversity has its place, all, all, all these wild critters, but that also we are recharged and we're replenished and uh, the stresses of 21st century life are uh, reduced uh, by nature. I love that description. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was uh, getting a tour of Laguna Honda to mm -hmm. Idolize Laguna Hana, that was absolutely an important piece that the patients mm -hmm. have views of green. The biological, we are biological beings. And we cannot know. get away from that. All right. So this, I, I'm going to start with Gretchen and then I'd like Lou to weigh in on this. So uh, there's a lot of work to do out there, right? And so particularly, you know, those of us involved in government agencies, we always have to prioritize and think about resources and figure out, you know, where we're going to invest our our time and, and energy and funding. So what do you think should be our, our highest priorities for nature con uh, conservation in San Francisco? Well, the city of San Francisco has done a nice job of, of documenting what exists here, of making sure that, it's, uh, that, that there are wild areas in a lot of the parks. And I think it would be um, pretty easy to come up with a set of standard metrics to monitor in all the wild areas across the, the city. Um, you'd want to get expertise from the universities and institutions like the Cal Academy um, that could help design the monitoring programs so that they're done in a cost-efficient way. And gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could do it and involve citizens? Um, so have a way to integrate the scientific community, the land managers, and the people of the city. Because I think you, you own the city in a, little, in a different way when you're responsible for something in it. And that's one of the great things that, that helping in, in these projects can do. And it doesn't, uh, we find a lot of people aren't really interested in learning um, the scientific end of it. They just want to do something to help. And um, sometimes it's taking a shovel and digging out some, some plants. Uh, sometimes it's collecting the data. And sometimes it's analyzing the data. But I think there's room for everybody. I, I, as as a, a city department head and someone charged with, um, you know, um, pursuing our, our strategic plan and our strategic plan goals, I really love the idea of some uniform metric setting. Yeah. I think that that is one of the hardest things for us, and particularly when we all have overlapping roles and responsibilities, yet we're guided by different sets of metrics and with different levels of effectiveness. And I think, that's I think the, you know, here in um, the Bay Area, we have the one TAM model where there are multiple, multiple <laughs> landowners who've come together and they <laughs> sat down and did an inventory of what's known um, across all of their different agencies. And I, I think there's a great opportunity either for the Bay Area or the city itself to do something like that. Yeah. 
I think when you look, at, you know, if you look at a map of the lands in public ownership, there are some great opportunities yeah. to connect some very big swaths. Uh, you know, we've been looking at this idea of, you know, Glen Park, you know, sort of from Glen Park BART Station, if you follow it up the canyon, and then over, you know, uh, Peaks Twin Peaks, yeah, Peaks uh, Peaks. and uh, over to Mount Sutro and to Golden Gate Park, that there's continuous lands, almost all in public ownership. Green there's corridors. Yeah. yeah, and there's, you know, there's Laguna Honda, which is this, you know, concrete lined reservoir that nobody uses for anything um, that could be, you know, go back to being a lake. So um, there are extraordinary opportunities yeah. in this city, not only to create natural areas, but to link them up. Because one of the things we need to do to protect biodiversity is not just think about islands, but think about corridors. Mm -hmm, uh, right. Because plants and animals need to move and they need to connect. They, if they get isolated um, from others of their kind, um, they will either uh, go into, you know, get inbred like the Habsburgs, or they will uh, <laughs> uh, they will uh, um, go extinct. Uh, some some local event will wipe them out. So so looking, at, you know, you, you think, oh, the city's so full, it's so dense. But even in this dense city, there's great possibilities. Mm, yeah, yeah. Oh. Let me. Shift to you for a second, because sure. um, I know you're doing a lot of conservation work in the Presidio, but again, what should all of our highest priorities be? I think we finish restoring the lands that we can. We have, we've started down this process. It's only been 20 years. We've got 20 more years to bring back the vital habitats that have been put in pipes, been covered over in asphalt. We, st we peel those back, and we bring back the wild lands that, that are there. So you start with that, and you, you, have, to, you have to know that these wild lands in an urban context, are not going to just take care of themselves. So we have to devote resources in the long term to ensure, just like we do in all of our parks, that those, those lawns are mowed and those hedges are trimmed. Well, the wildlands need to be tended as well. They don't just go off on their own in this urban context. We need to bring people into that process to understand that invasive species will still come in and take over if we let them go. It doesn't need as much energy as, as mowing a lawn, maybe in, in Golden Gate Park, but we, we need to still be there and, and lending a hand to help make sure it's fulfilling our desires for, for preserving biodiversity. So, Michelle, this is a last question before we open it up to the audience. We've been talking a lot about priority setting and you mentioned some pretty great examples of things that are happening right now to overcome some barriers. But from your perspective, what should the city's priorities be to further the work that you've already started in bringing more people to our national parks? Well, on the same tip about assessment, making sure we assess who we're serving and who we're not serving, mm -hmm. uh, because I think there are definitely inequities out there, but we just don't know unless we um, figure it out. So one of the things that um, we formed with the Presidio Trust um, Park Service and the Parks and Servancy is a like, uh, park um, youth collaborative where we've actually assessed um, all the youth programs and who we're serving and who we're not serving. Mm -hmm. And so together, so like one TAM, we are figuring out how to better the transportation, um, improve the quality of the curriculum, figure out what schools we haven't gotten to, um, and to ensure that everyone has access. So I think an assessment and, um, and then figuring out um, how we can better use our spaces um, and how um, students um, both in school um, and out of school can use that and families engage. I mean, creating definitely multiple ways for people to engage. I think there's um, been a lot of studies about, you know, how to engage young people um, and intensive, they found intensive um, time in the outdoors is one of the number one things. Um, and then combined with a youth development model to really, like, let youth be their full selves and do positive youth mm -hmm. development. But then how do you engage those families and get them to come along outside? And so Sunday Street's really engaging families so it's a whole community and thinking about how we design our parks. You know, some of the parks are meant for like, you know, one or two people going on a hike or they're, they're very isolating experiences. But for some cultures, you want to go with your whole family. You got your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, and you want to find the big barbecue pit or whatever. And then you go off to the beach. Um, and so thinking about even how we design things and, um, and how, the languages, as I said, um, that we speak it, um, for our staff, but really, really taking a crucial look um, at those things. And I know there's been some really neat um, things happening with Candlestick Park um, and other places to really connect um, different populations that have traditionally been marginalized from these spaces. I think I want to yeah, uh, echo Michelle's point about, you know, uh, culturally competent and culturally relevant park design and making sure that we um, understand why people use parks. 
uh, and it's almost a gateway to then appreciating biodiversity. You may come for the you know the family picnic, but then you stay for the nature. And and I think it's really important that we indulge that piece of park development too. Active recreation is very important. Community gathering, food, music, all of those things, even in precious natural lands, are really important to welcome people uh, uh, into our parks and thereby connect them with nature. Wonderful. So there's a lot of wisdom in this room, just like there's wisdom up here on with the panel. And I'm sure there is tremendous wisdom out there uh, in the larger community. So we wanted this to be a little bit of a conversation, an opportunity to, for, to hear from others what they think is important and also what they would like to hear from any of the panelists address. Uh, There's so many different directions this conversation can take. So Huey and Shannon are gonna be, have microphones. So if you have questions, raise your hand and who is helping us with the live streaming comments or, or do we get things from outside as well? Okay, but if we do, you'll let if us know. Do, okay, great. And Hi. say your name, please, and if you want to affiliate. Sure. Hi, I'm Sandy Mendler, and I'm an architect and planner with Methune here in San Francisco. And um, I have two comments. One is I got kind of excited about this idea as I was hearing you all talk that there could be a really interesting research agenda attached to this to look mm -hmm. at San Francisco as a model for livable <laughs> urbanism and really looking at the, the benefits that are brought by the natural systems in the city and you have so many great institutions here in the city that that could add dollars to the um, work that's happening and um, you know really amplify the benefits. So I'd encourage that to think about crafting a research agenda around this. My second point is, um, I think as we look at sea level rise and adaptation, which is inevitable and we already have a lot of adaptation planning going on in the city, is to think about how the new green spaces that get created at the water's edge um, and how those get linked and really how we make the most of those is a really important opportunity. You want to respond to that? Um. Yeah, I, well, the city is doing, a, it's updating its waterfront land use plan now. Uh, and one of those, one of the questions is, uh, you know, how do you adapt to sea level rise? There's the kind of, uh, you know, not wanting, you know, the Maginot line approach, right, which is a lot of engineering. And I think there will definitely be engineering. But uh, some of us on that committee are asking, well, you know, can, can waterfront open spaces help with, you know, uh, storm surges and things like that? Could restoring oyster beds uh, uh, help us with, uh, you know, not only water quality, uh, which we have perennial problems with, but also uh, dangers from flooding and ero coastal erosion and all those sorts of things. I think we're having the same conversation on the west side of town uh, around the Great Ocean Highway yep, the Ocean and the Ocean Beach Master Plan. Uh, same idea, which is, you know, can we go with a softer, greener, less like riprap and armor <laughs> uh, approach to uh, to how to deal with a shoreline, which you know, even if sea level wasn't rising, that's a terrible way to deal with your shoreline. Um, with sea levels rising, well, you know, you're going to spend a lot of money, and uh, you're still going to lose ground. But you know, can restoration help us be more resilient? Uh, help protect valuable property? Uh, can it uh, make these uh, you know uh, our shoreline, which is you know, these are enormous public assets. Most people love to be at the water's edge. Uh, in San Francisco, that's harder than it should be. It's not as inviting as it should be in, in many places. Can we turn these into recreational assets as well? And so it's a conversation that's being had right now, and it's very exciting to be part of that. And I encourage people to plug into that, uh, yeah. Phil. Well, I mean, an addendum to that, there's a couple things going on. The port has some amazing open space waterfront. But um, the other big project in San Francisco that's happening that everybody should keep their eyes on is in India Basin, where we have an opportunity um, to connect five or six different parcels owned by different land managers, another one town collaborative park planning process that will result in 1.7 miles of contiguous waterfront open space and this is our this is our Chrissy Field moment for the southeast <laughs> part of town um, uh, although it's the southeast part of town it, they say Chrissy Field was yeah they, they don't like that <laughs> <laughs> right? um, uh, but but the point is is that that this is a, a big legacy opportunity to take Chrissy Field was a military base an airstrip um, India Basin in the southeast was a shipbuilding yard, very industrial, a lot of hard edge, and we have an opportunity now um, through great park design uh, to create incredible environmental health, incredible biodiversity, interpretive education, 
Um, and also, as Tom noted, these parks are all being designed with soft edges that can absorb sea level rise uh, and actually not just absorb it, but thrive off of it. And yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add, um, if you want to see two examples along that southeast waterfront of amazing restoration, at, you can go to Pier 94 or Heron's Head Park. And yep. these are places that have been restored by loving hands and yes. lots and lots of time and effort by people. And they're amazing places to see wildlife. And Golden Gate Audubon has done an incredible job at Pier 94. And you can see um, endangered salt marsh plants and eelgrass beds coming back. And it's one of the only places you can see some open ocean um, marine invertebrate species. And um, Heron's Head is kind of the same. So I would encourage everyone to get out there and think about that extended along the southeast and how you can be involved in that process. And Gretchen, research it's agenda? San Francisco uh, State, is that a? You know, I have this vision that, I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could integrate um, schools from kindergartners to San Francisco State to, to graduate school beyond? And imagine if we could have kids out there um, starting when they're five-year-olds doing a little sampling in the park and every year build a little bit more until they're trying to apply to my lab so that they can come be colleges. Yeah. Um, but I just, I think there's this amazing opportunity here in San Francisco with with parks being walkable distance from everybody, to really both um, to learn about the city and to to teach people science and really do great things. Hence the Cities Connecting Children to Nature initiative, which is sponsored by the League of Cities. San Francisco is one of seven cities participating in a national plan to give all children a little nature every day. And that is the, the vision. And it starts with actually developing metrics and taking an inventory. It's the San Francisco co cohort, which is very cross-sector. The Presidio is involved in it, the National Park Service, the Academy. Uh, it's 40 or 50 different organizations. And the idea, we're starting with early childhood education. And we want to, we're trying to um, understand how much nature kids in different types of early childhood education are, are, are getting. And, and the idea is to do just that. But if we go, I want to just say, if we go back to the idea of there being a, a potential research program agenda, one of the great things about cities is you have the ability to test different things. Yep. And so, you know, we could see what if people do native plants, you know, in, in these areas, and what if they do things that are from California, not from the Bay Area. You know, there, there are ways to set up the, the work that gets done so we can answer some of the questions we need to answer to, to figure out how to manage in the future. It's about intentionality. Yep. Next question. Hi, Bob Hall here. I have a comment about public policy. Um, native plants are uh, an anchor here, and they draw birds and bees from all over the place, and they've all co-evolved together. Uh, how can we make it part of public policy here for the city to plant more native plants in public areas. At least any new plantings that they do make some kind of mandate that, you know, it's 75%. I know people need lawns to sprawl out on, but, you know, the, if the state of New Jersey can make it a mandate, why can't we do it here in the bubble? <laughs> your, your question is more focused on um, public policy that encourages uh, homeowners and residents to plant native plants or within the city, um, within city the agencies? City. Within the public, uh, within the, yeah. Here in the city. Well, you know, one piece of good news for you, I don't know that we've got a, a hardcore mandate, but a lot of us are all, really are working on that, and the city just approved something called the Natural Resources Management Plan, which was an environmental document that may have been three decades in the, in the <laughs> making, no joke. Um, and it does uh, call for sustainable landscapes, uh, native plants, it has a series of conservation strategies, uh, and the entire, you know, there were many, 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 many stakeholders that came together um, to, to think about how to best promote biodiversity. So the blueprint is actually there for that now. And while this is not a mandatory policy, uh, if anyone listening or any of you are interested in supporting native plants and all as well as Mediterranean plants that are appropriate, we have a wonderful tool, which is SF Plant Finder, and it's at sfplantfinder.org. Nice. And plug, that is plug. a great uh, <laughs> interdepartmental uh, partnership between the planning department, between Rec and Park, between the Department of Environment, where we all put our heads together and said, what is the palette that is out there that will be 
helpful to pollinators that will survive well, won't need pesticides, and supports native plants as well as a uh, climate appropriate plant. So that is not a policy requirement, but what we are thinking of doing and we are working on as a city is whenever we plant, we use that plant finder tool as our guiding principle for what to plant so that we don't have massive plant die-offs because the wrong plant is in the wrong place. Any other thoughts about policy? Um, yeah. I, I think we also just need to you know, experiment. I, the, I was thinking about the first block of Dolores when the, the Whole Foods project went in and you know, it had been a row of palm trees and lawn, right, right. which is most of Dolores Street. Then they said, all right, we're going to turn that first block into you know, kind of uh, a, a climate-adapted uh, a landscape. It's not all native plants, but includes many native plants, but that's friendlier to pollinators. And it's, it's actually kind of beautiful and pretty successful. Yeah. So uh, if you think about the public plantings in this city, you know, could we use native plants much more often than we do? Uh, I think so. You know, I was actually just in Charleston and Savannah, and that you know, all most of the trees are native. They use the southern live oak. Yeah. They use palmetto. They use magnolia. Um, we use magnolia as well. Uh, you know, it's native to the southwest uh, because, <laughs> or, because I think you know, there's a there's a plant palette that's used here because there are certain you know, very durable plants that will grow in very very difficult conditions. But uh, but uh, it's it's been great to see that broaden out a bit. Uh, and uh, there is that mandate, though, that they always, uh, and including in your front setbacks, there is a requirement in the planning code now that you're supposed to green your front setback. You're not supposed to concrete your entire front yard in San Francisco. That's actually illegal. Uh, and that you're, but the plants that you're supposed to use are supposed to be drought tolerant. So there's a few ways that the mandate's coming in. The lead, right? We talked yeah. about the yeah. academy being a green business, but you know, all lead certifications now require native or sustainable planting on any landscape areas. So that's, yeah. that's a strategy. And at Rec and Park, all of our, our um, park maintenance staff, all of our gardeners are expected to get something called base, uh, Bay, Bay Friendly Certification, yeah. um, which is a, a, you know advanced education on, on sustainable gardening and sustainable planting with natives. So. Great question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, oh, wait. No, sorry. Oh. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Uh, hi. Emil Fogarino. I teach uh, natural sciences at George Washington High School here in San Francisco. Wonderful. And I was wondering, what is your impression as a native San Franciscan of uh, the influence of high tech um, on the environment in this city? And our, what is their environmental ethic that you've experienced? Is it positive or negative? I would love my colleagues here who, <laughs> from universities and from museums. Um, what do you guys, what do you think? What do you two think? Um, I mean, I think that's a tricky question, but I think that in general, the, the use of technology that is made by people that build technology has done a lot to connect people to nature and to each other and to further the kind of work that all of us do because we can connect to our colleagues and we can connect to each other more rapidly and more quickly. I and mean, it's not without its drawbacks. I think bringing a lot of wealth and a lot of money changes things pretty rapidly. But I do see a lot of people out in parks, enjoying them in ways that are culturally appropriate, like that is culturally meaningful to them. And I think if we can figure out how to kind of channel people's love of being outside to protecting nature and biodiversity, that's something we all can do. So for me, like seeing people outside and enjoying nature is the first step. Um, and then the next step is getting people to appreciate it and protect it. And that's part of all of our jobs. So, Michelle, you're tracking who comes to the parks. Are the techies coming to the parks? <laughs> They're definitely coming to the parks. Everyone is um, nowadays, since it feels like. Um, but I think, um, yeah, as I said, it, it comes with its drawbacks, but there are its benefits. Um, there, uh, I think we need to embrace it. It's not going anywhere, technology, and so we have to figure out how to use it as a tool to our benefit. Um, you know, just like iNaturalist, where you can track and find out what species it is. How cool is that? And and especially with our younger generation, like they have brought been brought up with technology, so it's part of them. It's like another appendage, probably, for my son. Um, and so we have to like sort of figure out how to use that. I know he's really into video editing, so we. Um, I actually commissioned him for free to make a video <laughs> about these new Presidio backpacks that you can check out at the Visitor Perfect. Center. And so he used his love of video making to create this video and was outside doing leaf rubbings and, you know, doing all this stuff and then put it up on his YouTube account. So, um, so I think we have to, to, to use it to our benefit, um, else, you know, yeah. 
I think also just just keeping that balance. So, you know, it, it, if if you're connected all the time, it's great to be able to disconnect too. And I think nature is is you know is a way to recharge. You know, the the fact that technology allows us to always be working, uh, it, you know, isn't great for us. It isn't great for our health. It isn't great for uh, uh, our well being. And so uh, you know, it just makes it all the more important that we have nature in the city. I, I, I'd say just in terms of you know. Uh, sometimes the, the solutions that are really popular here are the kind of the gizmo green solutions. The more tech and the more complicated it is, the better. So uh, sometimes it's good in, in public policy to keep things simple. And, and I think it's important to remember that too. You know, so, uh, you know, electric cars are, you know, fascinating and they're going to be a, a great boon to cities. But designing walkable neighborhoods like, you know, old school transportation or riding your bike uh, is actually greener. So, you know, let's not forget that um, some of the most robust, some of the most resilient, some of the most elegant uh, technologies are the ones that have been with us for a long time. Um, some of the most uh, enlightened and some of the most healthful um, ways of designing cities are older ways of designing cities. So I, I think uh, we have an opportunity uh, to kind of mix old and new uh, in, in some ways that are going to be really great for us, uh, but it shouldn't be all old or it shouldn't be all new. Perfect segue. Are you? Oh, oh, are we going to start yeah, our I think, Oh, we're going to start I think we have five more minutes, so we're going to wrap it up. Okay, so, so this has been a somewhat serious conversation, right? It is a serious <laughs> conversation. So we're going to end uh, uh, with the idea, let's return to fun, because nature is fun. Um, and so uh, I'd like to we'll just go from right to left. Give me one fun thing someone can do today to connect with nature. Um, let's see. Uh, just find a place to put your toes in the water. Uh, yeah. Good. Stop. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say lie on your back and look up at a tree. Mm -hmm. Take that moment mm -hmm. of silence. Awesome. Mm. Yes, I'm going to say turn over a rock or turn, turn over a log and see what's living underneath. But put it back. But put it back because the things that live on the bottom <laughs> only live on the bottom. Turn it over, turn it back. <laughs> Michelle. Um, I would say use your senses of your, your ears and really listen. There are amazing birds out now, especially in the spring, and it's a beautiful sound. Lou. Volunteer in your parks. There are so many opportunities that Thank didn't you. exist 10 years ago to come out, pull weed, plant to plant, get involved in preserving the biodiversity of our, our collective parks. You're only 10 minutes walk away. And, we, right. and I'll plug one thing really quick. Um, Allison and I are starting a new partnership with the San Francisco Public Libraries, and this Saturday we're leading two community bio blitzes, um, one at 10 in the morning starting at Sunset Branch and one at 2 starting at Bernal. And so I would love to have people out there. We'll use iNaturalist. We'll walk from the libraries, and we'll see what we can find. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you so much for being here, celebrating the diversity not only of the humans in San Francisco, but the non-humans as well. So that's uh -huh. what's important. Thank it's you. It's cool to be green. <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy World Environment Day.